You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the Snyder Cut re-release of the podcast from April 2nd, 2021. It's still not safe for work. Recorded live from the world headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where it turns out economic anxiety was not the reason the meatheads stormed the Capitol. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. I'm about 65%. Yeah. You're st- so I'm good. I'm, still, I can sit and talk. Still eating the orange jello, you know. Yeah. I can sit and talk and bullshit. And really, what is podcasting? <laughs> but sitting more or less upright and bullshitting for an hour. So Yeah. Not this podcast. I just generally speaking, podcasts in general, that's what the other guys do. We give you really good, <laughs> thick, dense information for you to enjoy. But um, So yeah, I, I, uh, I am recovering from the thing that knocked my ass out of the game last week, just in time to steer nicely into the thing that's kicking my ass this week, which is an entirely different thing. It's non-life-threatening, but painful and welcome, like Rodney Davis. So <laughs> Our congressman. <laughs> yeah, it is It is an irritant. It's a Republican and- congressman kind of thing. It's not yeah. COVID. No, it's a Rodney Davis kind of thing. Uh, if he were um, an affliction that will pass in the next few days. Yeah. And, and um, you have some medicine, and we'll see how it works. And yeah. doctor, I, I was thinking this morning that our doctor is, and we have the same general practitioner physician that we go to and we see him together because we hardly are ever apart. Uh-huh. Um, but our doctor right now is a very Midwestern kind of doctor. Yep. I've had doctors in the Boston area where they're, you know, gods who float in. And uh-huh. they know they have the entire Boston medical profession behind them. And you basically genuflect and do what they say. <laughs> and then I have, I've been, you know, for a long time in, Bo- in Birmingham, Alabama, going to the doctor. And that was folksy, but also having the entire medical profession behind you. I think that's a typical thing of, you know, doctors are gods in our authority in our yes. world. Yeah. But uh, a little more folksy. But this guy is quiet, and he uh, pretty much just asks you, "What do you want to talk about? <laughs> do you have any issues?" And then he orders the labs and says goodbye. He's there to keep the lab billing your insurance yeah. company for sure. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, this is this is Obamacare, by the way. In yes, action. it is. Yes, it is. Um, this is also uh, extremely efficient. Yep friendly, um, uh, humane. And all of the expansion of Springfield Clinic was done through after Obamacare came in. Yeah. No, Absolutely. This is, this is, and this is now regular checkups and appointments and follow-ups and mm-hmm. there's no hassle with it. This is other than a few, you know, tweaks at the edges. This is how healthcare should be for everybody. Yeah. Yes, um, absolutely. And yeah. I do recommend if you haven't done it already, go, if you're buying Obamacare, make sure you go on healthcare.gov. Yeah. And re-enter your, you know, pre- what did they say? Report a life change. Yeah. And your life change can be adding a cell phone number, you know, or yeah. something. Whatever. So that you can see what the new post-April 1st right. uh, subsidies are. Because they're bigger. The subsidies are larger. And you will save money. Um, we did. Yeah. We saved money. One of my girlfriends, as I talked about earlier on the podcast, um, she went on on April 1st at 8 in the morning. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Because she was not qualified for a subsidy before, and now she is. Right. Yeah. And I did talk to her um, since she logged on, and she said it's like getting a um, stimulus check every month. Yeah, it makes a big difference. She's not qualified for a stimulus check, and before she wasn't qualified for, you know, she's she's a professional, and two incomes, one kid, so uh, she wasn't qualified for stuff. But now she's like, $1,400? I'm practically making that every month from the savings on health insurance. So, I'm making, you know. She's making money on the deal, which she is great. Is. <laughs> no, so so yeah. our advice to you is head on down to Crazy Uncle Joe's House of Healthcare, where <laughs> prices have been slashed and slashed, slashed and slashed. And slashed. They really now, have. Should 
Should we have really Medicare have. for all? Yes, we should. Yes, it should. Should there be a public option? Yes, yes there, should, there be. should. I agree with all of those sentiments. But if I can't celebrate the minor victories that we have along the way, right. especially when they're not so minor anymore, um, no, then I had I'm just, one very liberal friend of mine online today tell me, uh, I'm not giving up my union health care. It is better than anything I could buy on Obamacare. I'm like, okay. That's you know, great. I understand that. That's great. Right? I, no, nobody's coming for your yeah. guns or your union health care. I swear. <laughs> not right I now, swear. anyway. Yeah. I would love to come for one of those, but that's not how <laughs> things work in America today. Hey, Drift um, Class. Yeah. Happy blog anniversary. Thank you, Blue Cat. You know, many years ago, when I was just a, a wee shot glass, actually, Steve Gilliard, my, my blog father, the late Steve Gilliard, gave me some advice. And that was, you know, gave everybody advice, which is that you're starting off a blog, you're starting off a new thing, because he was the first guy to leave Daily Coase oh. for his own blog, to oh, start his own thing. I, I did not know that. He was the first guy on Daily Coase to be featured writer. He was the first guy on Daily Coase to be non uh, Marcos headliner. Well, I know and, he had a very low number of user number on Daily Coast. Yeah, well, he was, and he was, mad, and he did writing before that, mm -hmm. and then he left, uh, started his own thing, and became, you know, a, a semi legendary figure in the uh, liberal blogosphere. But um, he gave uh, new bloggers advice, which is, you know, don't jump up and down and wave your arms and self promote. You know, if you're very good, if you're good at all, you know that. They will come for you and things will work out fine, which uh, after 16 years, I will say is terribly shitty advice. <laughs> um, every successful podcast network, every successful blog podcast um, integrated thing promotes the shit out of itself mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. There's I, I'm going to get a little, not get ahead of myself, but there is a conservative podcast network that only interviews, practically only interviews writers of that conservative podcast written side. They quote their own articles. They cite their own people. They are relentlessly promoting their universe of people and rarely and their do brand. They, yeah. And they don't they don't step outside of it. Yeah. And you know, honestly, liberals higher way higher up the food chain do the same thing. I'm happy with where I'm at. Yes. Um, I think we are. We I, are I'm very happy. But to... the the idea that you shouldn't that you should, you know, hide your light under a bushel <laughs> and someone will eventually come and lift the bushel up. No. There's a lot of mythologies yeah. about, um, about social media communication. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one that I will not lay at Mr. Gilliard's feet was um, that blogging and then podcasting that came after he passed away um, will, will eliminate geography. Yeah. That you don't need to live in LA or DC or New York to blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you kind of do. Um, for, human nature, I human nature. Yeah, practical reasons. It is easier to hire your liberal friend and put them on the air who lives six blocks from you right. and has been to the same parties as you than to figure out who the hell is talking about anything in the middle of the Midwest. I get that. Um, but there are certain realities that, that govern human nature that cannot be defeated by technology. Mm -hmm. And one of them is that geography really matters. If you want to talk about politics on a regular basis um, with, pe with, with nerds, You'd better be in the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, I, you know, I, it's possible that COVID may change that. COVID is certainly changing the uh, geography of New York City. Yeah, um, that's and, true. And that's people true. in commercial real estate are panicking because nobody wants to come back into the city to work. Right. So I, and, I think there may be some changes that will be made where people say, look, I mean, this is Sean Hannity. Is You don't realize he's working from his basement and has yeah. been since what? 1999, you know, or whenever. Well, and if you could, I'd like to take the sentence, um, Sean Hannity has been, and just make that frame one it, word. And it that's, has that's, been, yes. That's sort of my yes. Christmas wish this year. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, it, COVID may change a little bit of that. I mm -hmm. like sending my children to small liberal arts colleges yeah. rather than big, huge Big Ten institutions. Nothing against big schools, mm -hmm. but I've always believed that smaller schools for the undergraduate experience is a good thing. And one mm -hmm. thing that happens is if you're at a school where there's 3,000 or 4,000 people, you tend to, if you see them in the city next to the campus, oh, that's a person from my college. You right. recognize them by sight. Right. And our audience is like that. They're in yeah. that size range. We have, you know, 4,000 regular listeners and goes up to 10,000 when we have a big show. Um, and 
when we get emails from people, I recognize those names going down yeah. my email. It's like, oh, I, I know who that is. I've talked to them many times. I've chatted with them. I, they're on Twitter with me. I do, you know, et cetera. And, and that intimacy is, for me, one of the great joys of being a yeah. part of the show. And, and the flip side of that is I have a special folder for some others of those people <laughs> where, where the mail just goes and it lives <laughs> happily on its own upstate in a there, farm. We don't have too many. I mean, I don't know about you. We don't have no, too no, many we, haters. We, we are we are really lucky. Yeah. I mean, um, we do not we when we attract haters, we attract haters. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't think this is the thing. We're not quite a big enough target. No, I think that's it. We're, we're just not quite not big enough to important enough to no, matter. And to that's that. so stay low. And then, and then I have on my Twitter bio, "Happy Wife of Drift Glass," which keeps the keeps a lot of the sexism away from me. And, and I do it that consciously. I know that that's I know what I'm doing there. You know, mm-hmm. as a woman on Twitter, to, first of all, I. I drink with the boys and yes. you can't offend, you can't offend me with sex jokes or, any, you know, I'll toss it right back. So people, people that know me know that. Um, but also just having that I'm married and here's my husband and that's it. <laughs> you know? it, it turns that attention off. It really does. Yeah. All right. So, so we've gotten, we've gotten off script quite a bit just in the first five well, minutes. Well, I, I did want to launch us into our discussion today. Yes. By oh, saying, just let me say, I think the best advice that, Steve Gilliard gave you. Get, out. get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> I can't be putting your comments up in the on my blog every three days. Go start your own damn blog. Because you know, I, and I'm sure a lot of people out there know what I feel like or felt like, which was I'm busting to say things that I think are relevant to the conversation, and they were. Um, they're greatly appreciated by the people by the, that community Steve built, and um, I didn't. I didn't have the guts to start my own blog, um, but you know, I figured I'll just. I'll just go ahead one day and start it. And my name is actually uh, Jimmy Drift Glass. I don't know if you knew that, <laughs> but yeah. Well, that, and that's how that name started. It was I, all it was was uh, I, I'm pretty sure I was you know somewhere in a coffee shop in mm-hmm. Chicago on a lunch break mm-hmm. and making a uh, making a very early comment. And I just picked a name that I thought was kind of cool and and had meaning. Um, and I do want to share because I think it's appropriate that yes, this is my 16th blog anniversary. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I've learned in 16 years blogging is that 16 years staring into the abyss is, is a very long time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but your it blog has bl- can drive now. So that's yeah, good. exactly. My blog can drive, but you know, it's going to sneak out at night <laughs> and it's going to probably imbibe things that I don't approve of. Yeah. And God knows just use protection blog for God's <laughs> sakes. Everything else is negotiable. Um, but the, uh, and you're, you know, you've got a slightly older blog than me. Just to buy a few months. Yeah. yeah. Well, in, you know, my November blog. November of 2004. My blog likes the older ladies. So, uh-huh. you know, See? Yeah, it works out really well. Um, the, um, the story I wanted to share was that um, one thing you do get from 16 years doing this literally every day is you can talk politics with your beautiful wife and not have to do a whole lot of note taking. And you do have a memory, a literal documented go through the archives. I remember him saying some shit about that. Oh, yeah, that was in 2000. And then it hits you. Oh, shit, that was in 2006. Yeah. Oh, God. So one of the first posts I ever wrote, the first, I think, first full-blown non-test post I ever wrote was about the Republican Party selling its soul to a corrupt, sociopathic lunatic. They gave him all their power. They handed all the keys of the kingdom to him. And when he turned out to be exactly who everybody knew he was and started taking revenge on people who stepped out of line, he demanded fealty. He demanded absolute, you know, bend the knee or I will destroy you. Um, and that left the GOP in a quandary, which is what do we do? We can't get rid of him because he'll kill us all. And we can't, do we cooperate with him? To, and they ended up just sort of going along till he died, you know, politically. But it is stunning. Well, and how, to, I know who you're talking about, and yeah. I guess the wrong person. I thought you were talking about Rush Limbaugh. But go no. ahead and tell people who it is. It is stunning how similar uh, the the rise and fall of Tom DeLay. Tom DeLay. Tom the Hammer DeLay is to um, Donald Trump. Yeah. And I wrote a post about, here's what the future of the Republican Party looks like. Mm-hmm. And the the mad religious Gorgon wing of the party is that they're going to take over completely. And the, the Thurston Howell, thir- the third wing of the party is just going to bend over and take it because they want their tax cuts. Yep. And that was fucking 16 years ago. Yep. And that's why I have no patience with Republicans who are now, you know, oh, my God, when did the Republican Party become full of these Republican people? Like, yeah. dude, Tom DeLay, I, dude, 
I was a I was a fledgling blogger in the middle of the Midwest and could see it clear as day, as could pretty much every liberal out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and the rise and fall of Tom DeLay does parallel. The fall of Tom DeLay parallels the I don't think we've seen the full fall of no, the former no, guy it's a, yet. No, it's more of a slinky kind of thing. Parallel, it just keeps going down. There down. is a parallel of just and, getting caught up in your own corruption to the point where no one just no one wants to deal with you anymore. Yeah. Except he has to be out of office because and, and then the, you're out of office, and then yeah. you can still have a following and so forth. Yeah. Uh, one other fun fact to hang off of that as a little Christmas ornament, if you don't mind. Um, this was the moment when Mr. David Brooks pivoted from. The Iraq war is going great. Everything's fine. Liberals are fucking idiots to, you know, really both sides are to blame both for sides. everything. Because Tom De- uh, uh, David Brooks reacted. New York Times columnist David mm-hmm. Brooks, who has been in that paper for 17 years, years, reacted to Tom DeLay's implosion and the horrific corruption that came spewing out of it was, you know, they're, they're the uh, Tom DeLay's on the right and the Internet Tom delays on the, the left. Internet Tom delays that he didn't. I swear name. to God, he wouldn't. And then he, he invented a third. Them. He invented a third party, and and the third party was the McCain Lieberman party. <laughs> and he has been writing that same fucking column every time Republicans shit the bed for seventeen fucking or sixteen years. Yeah, and, and, and on PBS pretending that he's never heard of Rush Limbaugh. I don't know who I don't Rush, know Rush Limbaugh, Limbaugh talks about. Uh, I don't know. Delay, that doesn't just affect talk, me. No, I want to talk about humility. Really do much with him. He's sort of a sideshow. Yeah. So that that is the that is literally the point source of the last big bang in the GOP. Yeah. Which was that's when it was clear this is what this constellation is going to look like yeah. until the whole party dies. Yeah. Until David yeah. Brooks is dragged screaming off of the New York Times and made to work in a real job somewhere. Right. And until the Republican Party just wanders off into the into the bushes and gets lost. Well, it becomes the the Orange County Republican Party in California. Yeah. You know, but there's going to be white this people screaming at the sky. You know, there's going to be this this party of of knuckle dragging reprogrammable meatheads mm-hmm. that are going to be the Republican Party. And if you want to win on the Republican Party, you damn well better get right with them because right. a- after the way left, Rush Limbaugh was primary. still primary. Yeah. And there's going to be this apologist wing that takes every Republican atrocity and blames 50 percent of it on Democrats. Mm-hmm. And that's and Democrats me. aren't taking it anymore, at least well, at least in Democratic media. They're not taking it. Anymore. And that's me predicting that. 16 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, like I said, I get real impatient with people who <laughs> suddenly <years>. come. <laughs> who, for, I get really re- pissed off with paid political professionals who've been paid for their political opinions and been wrong all along. Yep. Suddenly they have an epiphany and their first reaction is, well, I should keep my job, obviously, because I finally figured this shit out. I finally figured out two and two is four. Yeah. Well, you're supposed to be teaching math. You didn't know shit about math. Why do you get to keep your job as a math teacher? Well, because this isn't math and it's not engineering, it's not science. It's punditry. Right. It doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong because nobody has any memory of anything. But, so, and then when you reach a level in your career where you pretty much know you're safe, like Lester Holt. Yeah. And you win the the Lifetime Achievement Award. From, Edward R. Murrow you know. Award. Yeah. <laughs> then you get to give a speech to other journalists and talk about, you know, how, you know fairness is overrated and we don't need to give equal time to lies. Yeah. And uh, the Daily Caller flips out over your speech and so uh, you're silencing conservative thought. Mm-hmm. But the only reason Lester Holt can say that is he's safe. Right. And, you know, he waited until now for the Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award mm-hmm. to finally speak up and say, you know, we don't need to give equal time to lies. Are you saying, Blue Gal, in 2030, when Chuck Todd wins the Edward R. Murrow Prize, he will suddenly rip off his mask and we'll see, oh, my God, it's Michael Moore or somebody well, like he that. Already, he already today did the, you know, Hillary is overprepared part infinity with, yeah. yeah, oh, 200, you know, everyone in America, every adult, everyone over the age of 16 by the mid-April will be able to get a vaccine. And we'll have 200 million shots in arms, not, yes. not shots out there, shots in arms. We'll have 200 million right. by the first 100 days. You know, I think Biden is making a mistake here. By blah 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 blah. Well, yeah, that. Well, and and this is um this is going to be the theme of the, the rest of the show in in a, in a in a weird way. Okay. Conservatism is an inherently oppositional philosophy. Yes. It's designed to stop other things from happening mm-hmm. or slow them mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. And conservatism, I can understand a car needing an accelerator and a brake. Mm-hmm. Our political system has an accelerator and a group of people who want to bomb the car out of existence. Yeah. Yeah. And to stop it, because everything to do with it, every time they win something, it's not enough. Yeah. Because you had to convince, you know, 70 million people that 
government, representative government was their problem. Mm. And therefore, we must get rid of representative government, replace it with a you know orange strongman. Yeah, yeah. and that's not not a fact that our moderate Republican friends want to deal with. Mm-hmm. I I'm waiting for you know if they're if if the moderate Republican theory of government, which is accommodate them at all costs, don't let liberals do anything, were true, Susan Collins would be a, a Democrat today. Yeah, absolutely. And Lisa Murkowski would have switched parties the minute the election absolutely. was over. Mitt Romney would have switched. Yep. None of these people are switching parties. Adam. Saint Adam Kinzinger. He would be a Democrat already. Is is all of his Democrat? Yeah. All of his policy positions are just bullshit right wing nonsense. Right. Same shit. All of them believe, but he wants to be you know bold and say Donald Trump was a bad man. Yeah. Well, good for you. Um, but none of these people have the balls to actually quit the party. Very much like their their counterparts in the media, they want to be either independent. They want to do anything but join the people they've been demonizing for thirty years. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Well, and I think. I've been literally praying about this because I feel as though so much of what we're dealing with today is fear and fear of losing your place, fear Mm -hmm. of climate change and and use climate change as an example, because climate Mm -hmm. change to me and to a lot of people is such a huge problem that nothing I personally can do is going to fix it. You know, I can try to recycle. I can try to turn down my air conditioning and drive a uh, drive less, uh, you know, do whatever I can do, use less water when I shower. I, though, all I tell you things. what, let's stay home for a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, does a, that does the ecology a lot of good. Yeah. Um, it's terrifying to think of the world heating up to where most of it is uninhabitable by human beings. Mm-hmm. And the way you respond to that, if you're a liberal or a progressive, is, all right, let's look at the science and see how we can fix this. Right. And the way you look at it when you're a conservative is blame Democrats. <laughs> right. And dig your heels in, right? And I'm not going to change because I like burgers and I like my gas engine and so forth. And I think that that's just a, a microcosm of what the whole of conservative versus liberal is, is there, it is an out. Fox News is an out for people who do not want to face the fears that they have about existence. Right. And so if we can... And I'm not saying that we can fix reprogrammable meat bags because I don't think we can. But if we can fix the middle, like you've said so many times in the past, if you can fix the middle where you're not saying both sides because you're not if you're saying both sides, you're not really helping anyone. It, it's lying. harmful yeah. to the conversation to say both sides. And it, that's come to me more intensely recently that the both sides is, a, is not just a way to soothe the waters. It's actually harmful. Well, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion that um, Lester <laughs> Holt will be is having. Is it a podcaster ethics panel, Drift Glass? Uh, Lord knows I have been <laughs> uh, enough of those. Nothing gets done. Everyone's drunk by two. Yeah. So no. Um, no, the panel discussion where um, the both siderist issue is tackled and Lester Holt will moderate. There'll be Charlie Sykes and Tom Nichols and Tim. Oh, just a bunch of never Trumpers. Yeah, there won't yeah. be any liberals there or anything. <laughs> but because who needs us anymore? Does they Charlie get to go? <laughs> Oh, of course he does. And <laughs> and failed one-term congressman, uh, Denver Riggleman. Yeah. Uh, because being a failed one-term congressman who got run out of your own party, who just brags incessantly. You know, I don't know if you know this, Blue Gal, but I was run out of the party because I uh, officiated at a gay wedding. And I said, I don't care what the consequences are. Did you know I was a bouncer once? Yeah, that's why I became a bouncer. You know, I was in the military for a long time. And let me tell you, I parole, I patrol the border. And it just, yeah, I know. And you're not a congressman anymore. So why am I listening to you? Well, they threw me out. Well, why do you think that is? And and what comes after is a list of grievances against Democrats. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, it's like they just can't learn. They're functionally incapable of learning. And I understand they've been in this life for their whole life. They can't stop. When I hear, I don't know, pick one, Mona Charon mm-hmm. and her little little waxwork figurines that go on, on uh, the Bulwark podcast once a week, cackling over the same stupid fucking liberals are so dumb jokes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But they were saying they were they were telling in the eighties. Now it's you know not political correctness, the fucking political correct left. It's the uh, it's the it's woke, woke culture, woke woke woke, yeah. And instead of feminazis, it's cancel culture. Uh-huh. But uh-huh. it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Well, and, and they, instead of Solyndra, it's COVID passports. Right. They're just it. It, it is. They, they can't stop hating us. Yeah. Which is kind of a victory, I guess, because, you know, we are so Maybe deep in their it. mind. I think that's how Jen Psaki is looking at it. 
Oh, she's <laughs> she's the best. Someone put a, a picture of her smiling and dancing her way onto the podium and so forth and being very confident. She's and I amazing. posted, a, I responded with a picture of her the day after election day on tw- in 2016, mm-hmm. when she and the entire White House staff was standing outside the Oval Office in that portico with their arms crossed as Barack Obama said, yeah, 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 we lost. And yeah. we're going to, you know, America is going to survive this and we're mm-hmm. going to assist the the new com- incoming administration and go by the book. Mm-hmm. And everyone in that staff looked like they died. And yeah. and Jen, we all had. And John, Jen Psaki was standing in the middle there just with, you know, ashen. And yeah. I said, that is the sword. That day is the sword that she carries in with her to that briefing room right. every day. And and you don't notice sometimes because she sounds like Glinda the Good Witch. She does. She sounds oh, like hello, a sweetheart. Everyone. How are you? And then she very carefully, like a third or fourth grade teacher, which my mom was, yeah. by the way, uh, slowly corrects the Fox News mm-hmm. guy on the lie mm-hmm. he just told. Actually. Actually, <laughs> actually I'm going to have to refute that because you see, here are the facts. And go fuck yourself. Yeah. Next question. And uh, there's actually a, there's... is a grade school teacher's word. Oh yeah. Way. You don't oh, it's, tell. It's... You don't. You never tell a third grader you're wrong. That's terrible. How bad you are. You just actually, actually. The facts are different than the, than the what whatever you mush you've out of your, your head. Hole. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's all these questions about um, why is this asshole from Fox going to keep Mr. Ducey? Uh, going to keep this up. Why, why does she keep calling on him? I'm like, dude, why wouldn't she keep calling on him? It's like calling on a tackling it's a, it's dummy. Her, it's her made for TV viral moment. Like yeah. she can, she's guaranteed. Hey, dumb, dumb, say something stupid. And then bam, <laughs> right in the face. And you know, the next day, time. never I know. disappoints. Yeah. And he, and he goes home and can't figure out. And yeah. that's the other problem. The right has that is incurable, mm-hmm. which is they are so atrophied when it comes to making legitimate arguments from good faith. Yeah. They don't know how to do it anymore. It's just asshole, asshole, asshole all the time, throwing shit against the wall. Speaking whatever sticks of assholes. Hey, do you know who's the biggest asshole in the country right now? Right Luke now. Because people have been waiting. They're, we're at 28 minutes and we haven't mentioned Matt Gates yet. And everyone was so disappointed that you were too ill to podcast about Matt Gates last I'm going to sit back and let my it wife hasn't gotten set any on fire. Better since no, then. no. Well, you know, I, I'm like... How long was I asleep? Because yeah. first of all, Mitch, Mitch McConnell is now anti corporate. Yeah, and and Matt, have, I've been asleep for like a hundred years, and Matt Gates is going to jail more than likely. Yeah, um, he's certainly not going uh, back to Congress. I'm guessing that. Well, we'll see. He might get reelected mm-hmm. and then get arrested, like like yeah. Duncan Hunter did. Yeah, wouldn't that be a special special day? Because yeah. he's from Joe Scarborough's district down in Panhandle of Florida, so yeah, they like frat boys. You know, they do. that's the thing. Yeah. Um, but it, it's not just frat boy behavior. It's no. entitled assholery when it comes to right. women and sex and entitled, just entitlement. Just, I can do this because my dad has money and I have power. Right. And so naked pictures, showing them at work, fuck you, I can do this. Right. Makes me and, feel good. So. And he's found a party where yeah. entitled asshole behavior is literally all they have left. And you're There's... rewarded for it, and you can yep. fundraise off of it because yeah. you can claim victimhood when they call you out on your bad behavior. Yep. Yeah, yep. you can run around screaming the N-word for an hour. Yeah. And then have your N-word video taken down and then run around screaming, cancel, cancel, cancel. Cancel culture and... For another and, hour and raise money. Know, they're oppressing... <laughs> they're silencing conservative speech. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and your colleagues can do nothing about it because they're right. all standing there waiting for Donald Trump to say something. Right. Please, Donald. Please say about Donald. Yeah. Donald does your breakfast for him. Yeah, You're just right. another burger and fries for him. Yeah. And yep. he is. And I don't I am so glad there is not a daily bombardment of orange deranged. But the residue is still there. Yeah. Well, because, because people need something to get hits and attention. And so. Right former guy is is still fodder for that and discussing infrastructure does not get hits and clicks no although not. honestly if i could just get pete Buttigieg to come to my house and explain things to me i'd be very happy because he's extraordinarily good he is i mean admittedly kind of robotically good yes but his he doesn't have a monotone voice but he well you know here's how it goes 
this is how this is this is the word infrastructure. Let's break it down. And he just explains he it's not quite a filibuster. Mm -hmm. He just rolls right over the idiot on Fox asking him about well, why is this infrastructure and all this money for other stuff? Well, because it's more than roads and bridges, dum dum. It's like he and Jen Saki went yes. to the same Ikea class. School. Yeah. 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 Just of explaining it factually. And, and like you said, they're it, doing it in such a way that you can't bamboozle your way out of the facts that were just given. It's very, he's yeah. very good at it. Yeah. And, and not to, not to get off of Matt Gates too quickly. It's just that no. that story no. is still developing. <laughs> and, it is. Uh, it is. And, and I think we've, we've summed it up. You know, he's just an entitled asshole and uh, has hurt women and taken advantage of them. And I think mm -hmm. is a little bit confused that uh, if you buy a woman, an underage woman dinner and jewelry and then have sex with her that's still paying for sex with an underage woman. The girlfriend experience is still paying for sex, Matt. And I went to high school with a guy like this. Did you? And uh, for a brief time, he was my debate partner. Oh, Lord. And he was an entitled asshole. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get along at all, but there was nobody else to team with. So he was my team. And one night we find ourselves crashed in um, Chicago at his brother's apartment. And uh, I'm just sort of sleeping on the floor and he's going to go out on a date. And I'm not sure these were his final words to me before he left, but you know, if she, if you buy her dinner, she can't refuse you. Oh, wow. And out the door he went and I just imagined, and he got home real early because mm -hmm. apparently she slapped him and left. Yeah. yeah. And, and what's more is he was completely confused by that. Yeah. He thought, well, there's a set of rules that I'm sure my asshole father taught me that is, this is how women are They're yeah. there. And, um, I think I might have mentioned also my uh, ex was a judge. Yes. Yes, And you she did. would hear these cases of, of absolute, of course I grabbed her tits. I'm her boss. I get to do shit like that. From these most, I got to say, mostly construction guys yeah. who have their own construction company and got sued. And, you know, you still have to affirmatively prove your boss did whatever it is you came. It's but still very unfair. But I get to do that. Right. <laughs> But it's like he did not, nobody explained to him yeah. that you don't do that anymore. And you know that guy today is wearing a red MAGA hat. Or and, he's governor of New York. Yeah, or he's governor of New York. <laughs> or he's or he lost $9,000 because of re recurring payments to Donald Trump that he didn't mean to make. Oh. But, you know, yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's, we've it's, all learned the term UX, right? User and yeah. you're the user interface on the, uh -huh. the Trump donation. That's why I don't give no money to nobody. <laughs> We're, we're doing a much longer podcast than I had planned to do because the idea was to get you back on on the air. But well, uh, let, let's go ahead. Go ahead. No, uh, well, I know you want to talk about voting today. I just quickly want to talk about voting, and I want to ask you your opinion about something because we haven't okay. discussed this. All right. Um, one of the goals of the Illinois Democratic Party is to get rid of Rodney Davis, our congressman in Illinois 13, to because we lose a seat in the redistricting of Illinois. Right. And. I will tell you that our district, Illinois 13, is specifically gerrymandered to produce a Democratic congressman, which has failed. And Repeatedly. The yes. reason it failed, I believe, is because the Democratic Party of Illinois thought, well, if we contain college campuses from normal Illinois all the way down to Edwardsville, and it's mm -hmm. like this strip from Bloomington Normal all the way down to St. Louis. It's like this yeah. long, skinny snake that goes down that way. Uh -huh. Um and we have all these college campuses in one district, for sure we'll get a Democratic candidate. And college students don't turn out to vote. So, And then a slice of the state capital, but not the whole capital. Not capital. the whole state capital, just right. the Democratic part. Right. Right. And it has not worked because no. the Fox News viewing of South Illinois, very resentful of Chicago, can be easily manipulated if, you, if Rodney Davis, as he does, runs against the corrupt political machine of the state house rather than running against Democrats in Washington. Right. But he can run against Democrats in Washington too, and that'll work. <laughs> but with, with the farm community, with the right wingers. Right. And, but he often, as he did in 2020, run against the corrupt political machine in quote unquote, in Springfield as, you know, which he's a federal officer. It's not a he state is, official, but it doesn't nothing matter. Nothing to do with that. But, but everyone, <laughs> His opponents were all obviously stooges of the corrupt of the political machine, corrupt, blah, 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 right. blah. If they ever had right. a job in state government, then they right. are stooges of the corrupt machine politics of the state house. Yeah. So, but my question is, you know, Rodney Davis, I'm going to say this because I rail against him a lot because he voted to take away my health insurance. He did. 
but he's not the worst Republican congressman in the state of Illinois. By a long shot, he's not the worst. Yeah. The Democratic Party could get rid of Darren LaHood. And just as an example, you mean redistrict Davis voted for... You mean redistrict Darren LaHood, right? What? The, the Democratic Party could just as easily redistrict yeah, Darren LaHood. redistrict LaHood. Darren LaHood out of a job. That's what right. I'm saying. He's much worse. Much worse. Well, just as an example, Rodney Davis voted in favor of the Violence Against Women Act. Mm-hmm. And Darren LaHood didn't. And Rodney yeah. Davis voted to, you know, authorize the 2020 election and, and you know, went... Because he, because he, he's basically a Pence Republican, right? I mean, he right. he does things by the book, and he wants to be in leadership, and that's so he's going to play it very, very safe and not vote in in things that are going to draw attention to him in that way. Yeah, he is extremely risk averse, right? Right, and so he'd rather he, that, vote just keep on the down low and not have anyone be able to run against him with the campaign ad that he right. voted against the Violence Against Women Act, right? Um, it was very close in 2018 because his opponent could say he voted against Obamacare and that yes. almost lost him his seat. And then in 2020, he got 20,000 more votes more or votes so than because he, got... he ran against the corrupt political machine in Springfield rather right. than, yeah, talk about so, Donald Trump. His campaign ads did not mention Donald Trump. He did not have his picture taken with Donald Trump. No, why would he? He was not that's, a Trump that's... Republican. He was just Rodney Davis. So, mm-hmm. so I wonder about that as a, as a, technique that the Democratic Party of Illinois wants to get rid of him. And I guess it's because Illinois 13 is the white whale that they created and they want to be able to catch it. They want to be able right. to say that we can get that downstate district. Um, well, I, I, it's it seems to me that I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not privy to the corrupt you're Illinois not inside that state corrupt house. circle of no. Illinois state house. Okay. <laughs> I, I know some people. They're really nice people. You know, they have lovely kids. There's and a lot I'm of sure, nice people you know, in Springfield, regardless are. of party. There, there really are. That's my um, other point. Yeah. The uh, But I think it might be that since they ran Rodney twice mm-hmm. and lost twice, it's like, okay, we're not going to beat this guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's just, he's just jello. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, he just, he's a cipher and he's, He's inoffensive and he just stands there looking like, uh, you know, the, the deer in the headlights and talks about farmers mm-hmm. and how much he loves Illinois mm-hmm. and the, that those those politicians in Washington. Darren LaHood is a, you know, a, a fang bearing yeah. bug eyed right. monster. Right. He's a typical Trump Republican. Right. So maybe the calculation is, look, we got to get rid of one of these guys. One of these guys is going to go just because of the numbers. Right. And as long as we're redistricting, let's keep the one who's the bigger boogeyman. Okay. And and hope we can knock him off. Well, I don't and think maybe they the will. the fact that he's primed for leadership in the House of Representatives, it's he's a bigger he's a bigger fish to get. Yeah. Cuz he was and maybe we he can was a minority force, whip. Maybe we can force LaHood and and uh, Davis to primary each other. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Maybe. That'd be fun to watch. All right. I don't maybe know. Maybe that's it. But maybe that's it. Okay. The other knows? question I have is today is election day and yay all four uh, registered Democrats. We're all registered Democrats. But all four registered voters in our household voted in this local election. I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Drift Glass called me a ward boss yesterday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those really. Kids to vote. Okay, you know how to vote, you're, right? You're in town. Here's you what you do. Until Tuesday morning and go vote. <laughs> right. Oh, really? It was yeah. like it was impressive as hell. It's like, yeah. okay, I'll get you a pizza, but here's the deal: <laughs> you have to go vote on Tuesday morning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he wanted to. You know, he's a political science major. Of course, he wanted to. But yeah. he wanted to vote. But um, there was a the Democratic Party here is pretty well organized, knows our house and knows to leaflet our house. So we got a lot of leaflets about who to vote for. We did. And uh, that was helpful because on some of these races, the parties are not listed. Right. Um, on the local races, they tend to just play nice and not be party affiliates it's, because it's a, they're it's working a, on the park board, the public It's a tradition. Board. The mayor doesn't list his the mayor political isn't, yeah. no. Everybody knows he's a Democrat, sort of. But yeah, well. he's not. He's yeah. He's not, party affiliation is not broadcast. So there were, you know, for for the park board, you're supposed to vote for these two people. For a school board, you're supposed to vote for these two people. And the Democratic Party said that. Then there's this one local race called S M E A A, which uh, is a committee of people that run the Bank of Springfield Center, which is the big auditorium downtown. Right. And they are the committee that supervises that organization. Um, yeah. It's it's basically rented out most of the time to yeah. other people to put on events. It's where the high schools have their graduation. It's where the big uh, high school basketball tournament is played and things like that. It's it's our if you're from Chicago, I know a few of you are. It's our McPeer. Yeah. Okay. Um, except we don't have you know rides or 
or concerts right, or right. any cool stuff, it's really. It's a public f- functionary thing. Right. And there were three people running to be on this SMEAA board. And the Democratic Party didn't have any postcards or any leaflets about who to vote for on this one, which makes me think that all three of the people running were Republican. Yeah. I went and Googled all three of them. And one was a guy who owns a restaurant downtown. We sort of know the restaurant. Um He's run for everything. He's run for mayor. He's run for this. He's he's just kind of a gadfly who runs for stuff in addition to owning this restaurant. Um, he's he's not the gadfly you're thinking of, though. He's not the no. he's not the elegant restaurant. He's the other. He's the Italian restaurant guy. Ah, that's right. No, that yeah. Saputo's. Yeah. Right. Okay. Then there was this woman, and I googled her, and it was like, wow, she's a Republican bundler. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're not going to vote for her. Third guy didn't have a a website. He had a Facebook page. And I go to his Facebook page, and every single post is about his work at the BOS Center. You know, we've had some of the greats here. We've had uh, Dolly Parton has sung here, and so Mm -hmm. has Lyle Lovett. And, you know, we've just had some great concerts and events, and I look forward to four more years on the SMEAA board. I hope for your support because, you know, we do a good job and I sure do enjoy working with Frank and Bob and all the other guys here down at the center. It's an unpaid position <laughs> and it's this guy's life. And, and it's not going to lead him to the Senate. It's it's his it's obviously his ambition to be on this committee and do right. his stuff. He's it's, a he's nerd. Proud of it. He's proud of right. his work. He gets along with his colleagues. He's not paid for it even, no. you know, it's right. just, this is what he does. And I voted for him and I, yeah. and, and I told my kids to vote for him because I thought he's not going to do any harm, you know, right. first do no harm. And it made me feel bad that there wasn't a blatant Democrat running, yeah. but it's an unpaid position in that is actually a job that somebody has to yeah. do and yeah. he likes doing it. So, right. okay. And that's, there are any number of jobs like that yeah. at, Nonprofits, church, yeah. etc. Well, I don't know people. why this is an elected position. I don't know why the city council just just appoint people that want to do it. But well, there's you know there's an infinite number of boards yeah. and uh, in Springfield that people get elected to and appointed to, yeah. and it's yeah, it's well, a whole the park social board is thing. another one, and that one yeah. is very competitive for some reason. Being yeah. on the park board is a big deal. But it's, it's a it's I can understand. I mean, you voted for them, him for those reasons. I voted for him because my ward boss told me. Yeah, to. I, I pointed so, out why I voted for this guy, and I said, if you're going to vote in, if you're going, if you don't leave it blank, leave it blank. That's I don't have a problem with that. But I wanted you to know how I voted and why I voted for this guy. No, and there is there are perfectly. I have voted for libertarians in the past. Mm-hmm. I have voted for a, one or two Republicans in the past. Way down the ticket. Yeah. Uh, at really highly technical, um, or well, you highly know that involved. That's their ambition is to do a job, yeah. right? You you went to you went to college to to study hydrology. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and this is this this position requires a good hydrologist, <laughs> and nobody else is running. I'm like, you know what? I don't care. Fine. Yeah, that's great. Right, right. I don't feel like I betrayed my ideals by you know casting a vote for Susie, the hydrologist. <laughs> Uh, who all she wants to do is, you know, measure toxic levels in water. Because yeah, that's right. what I And she wants that's government to work, which unlike certain Republican congressmen I know, yeah, you know, if I feel like this this Bank of Springfield auditorium guy wants the auditorium to function. Right. <laughs> and and I've encountered those people when I worked at the city of Chicago, mm-hmm, which was mm-hmm. and one guy there who was like a raging libertarian. Oh god. Um, and a complete asshole and had like a picture of, you know, whatever. And he, and would, would come, I would put up a, a quote of the day. Part of my thing was running the network and 50 other things. And I put up something about, you know, something from Orwell. This is during the Iraq war. Oh yeah. And he came, he's all of, you know, two feet tall and he didn't, wasn't my boss. He came all stomping into my office, demanding I take it, t- take it down. Cause your liberal political position. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Orwell is a liberal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, whatever. And, but he's, the, he was a seething kind of angry little libertarian guy who yeah. got where he, who got into his position by sucking up to aldermen, by sucking up to, uh, to directors. Yeah. By by planning parties for them, by always making sure everyone knew where the, where the drinks were, mm-hmm. and broadly speaking, hated government. Yeah, and will work in government for the rest of his life. His <laughs> corner, take a pension from the government. His, absolutely, <laughs> his corner of government is, is the good gov- yeah. is the good corner. <laughs> Everyone else is a you know, liberal, you know, cesspool of corruption. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's like you can just see the little tiny mushy part of his brain doesn't work anymore that that reconciled those right. two. No, no right. government is bad yeah. or government is good. I know it's a dumb argument, but let's reform the parts that are broken and 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 have the parts that work work. And they're just people like that. So as long as they don't get out out of containment. Yeah, no, you that's know, it. Then they're if fine. this guy decided to run for mayor, I wouldn't vote for him. Yeah, I'd check out no. his party before I yeah. voted for him. But and I, I did wonder, um, in, I, I, there's no answer for this, but maybe one of the wise listeners out there could tell me, has anyone ever run for congressional office in Illinois, mm -hmm. um, especially in the last, I don't know, five years, maybe 10 years, on the platform that Republicans are evil? Mm. Not healthcare is good. Some gun control is okay. Let's all work together. Let's, no, fuck unity. Screw bipartisanship. The reason I'm running is because Republicans are evil people. You know, I think Jan Schakowsky come close to that. Yeah, but she, you know, I, I lived in her district for 20 yeah. plus years. I think she, she comes close. And there's no opposition. I'm wondering if anybody no, has no run in gonna, a No one's going to run against Jan Schakowsky. No, no. That's like a D plus 90 district. <laughs> Um, she was no on Chris gonna... Hayes the other day, and she was just totally fangirling over Chris Hayes like a grandmother. It was adorable. Oh, yeah. Well, she's one. Of, she was my congressman yeah, for she's many a years. Great lady. Great lady. And uh, met her personally many times. Many times. I've met her. Um, she's been at Net Net Roots. Yeah. yeah no, she's yeah. great. All um, right. I, what... We're gonna we're gonna switch gears, Jeff Glass, because I'm gonna give you the floor for the rest of the show, which is 48 seconds, right? <laughs> to talk about Tom Nichols and student loan forgiveness, because he. For some reason, came out against student loan forgiveness. Right. And you shocked me yesterday while we were waiting for the, to see your doctor to get you better uh, to, by telling me that Tom Nichols is the same age as you are. Yes, he is. Um, yeah, Tom Nichols decided Tom Nichols is a contrarian asshole. <laughs> um, he knows a great deal about the Cold War. He teaches it, I believe, at the War College. Um which is weird because if he's really good at teaching threat assessment, how did he not notice his Republican Party was full of Republicans <laughs> for the last 30 years? Um, and and he gets really, really pissed when people check because he is an expert in one field. He's got a book about expertise, but he clearly doesn't know shit about his Republican Party and he doesn't know shit about politics. Um, and he has very confirmed conservative opinions about what these kids today should be doing. Um, and he's wrong about all of it. And his response months and months and months and months and months ago when I was on Twitter, when I brought this subject up, was to block me immediately. <laughs> um, and he doesn't block Charlie Pierce because he's got like a weird music thing with Charlie. Okay. But he blocks literally anyone who says, you know, Tom, that's just not boom blocked. Um, so Tom Nichols is not in the self-improvement business or the self-reflection business or holy shit, I might have been wrong business. Tom Nichols is in the sitting on his porch yelling at kids business. And this time he decided to yell at people about student loan forgiveness. Um, that is a terrible idea. And, you know, and he starts off saying something like, you know, I'm not some boomer sitting out there. I, I, I'm in this, I'm in this, I'm not an old, I'm in this demographic that's right between the youngers and the boomers between 1957 and 1963. And it kind of slices it out. Like, yeah, you're exactly as old as me. And you sound like Montgomery Burns, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, the problem with youth today is they have too much money. And it's it's this whole Ayn Rand libertarian, well, you, you you signed the contract, you know, you entered into the debt voluntarily. Maybe maybe you're just a bad person. Yeah. You know, it's that it's really kind of that a, a spin on the welfare queen argument that you have been told. And he doesn't mention the part where you have been told for the last two generations that if you do not go to college, you will never go anywhere. Right. You will die poor under a bridge. Right. So you have to go to college and therefore you have to pay whatever they ask. And, and there's clearly price fixing when it comes to oh, tuition yeah. and financial aid. If you have kids that have applied to more than three schools, you realize, and, and they're playing to the same kind of school, this, again, the small liberal arts colleges, yeah. they're all approximately the same price and they're all approximately offering the same student financial aid bag. Yeah. And it's and I, conscious competition. You know, it's yeah. conscious price fixing looking at what each other are doing. Yeah. Well, I, I went back to college in my 30s to get my degree because mm -hmm. I, I came up through corporate training programs. I was a very good programmer and a very good systems analyst. and I was exemplary, but I didn't have a degree. Mm -hmm. So when consultants came and gutted my career and gutted the company I worked for, the first question was not, are you really good at your job? Because my former boss would now tell them, no, don't trust him. My, now it was, where's your degree mm -hmm. from in computer science? So I went back to school and I discovered, A, there was absolutely no financial aid 
for someone like me mm -hmm. in my 30s. None. There's nothing out there. I got a, like a Mensa scholarship for $400. <laughs> that was it. That was, so I went completely out of pocket mm -hmm. on college um, while working part time. And I also worked at Columbia College as I went there as a student. I went, I, I taught there and I, I ran, uh, partially ran one of their departments. Mm -hmm. So I was there for a long time. And you can just see that there's no relationship at all between tuition costs and college costs. Right, right. Because most of the teachers there, most of the professors there, when I taught there, myself included, were non-union part-timers who were paid a pittance. Absolutely adjunct. So where's the fuck is all the money going? Well, well it's, it's go they're hedge funds. They're investing it in their endowments. Absolutely. And once you create an inflexible demand mm -hmm. that, I'm sorry, whatever it is you think is fair, fuck it. You have to pay this, this these thousands of- This is into the middle class and you have and, to pay And your it. parents, you know, if you want Jimmy to fail, don't send him to college. Yeah, right. So I list, I read this article and just banging my head and it's like, yeah, I shouldn't, you shouldn't do this, uh, this uh, loan forgiveness thing because fuck those kids. I went to college and I paid for it. There's a lot of debt involved. And if you blah, 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 blah. The John Thune- you yeah, know, when I was right. four years old, minimum wage was six dollars. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, I had right. a car and a boat and a girlfriend. It was awesome. Yeah. So first of all, his theory of politics is as follows: you should not deliver to your constituents the stuff that you said you would deliver, mm -hmm. which is insane. Yeah. Right. I don't know of any political theory that says, you know, here's the important thing: once you get into office, don't do what you promised. The stuff you, you do. Th you <laughs> said you were going to do for you. <laughs> yeah. Because that's clever. Yeah. That'll definitely. And the reason you don't do that is because, and Tom Nichols in a different universe, in a different, not in universe, but in a different context, will rail against the Republican Party because he knows them to be, I mean, he'll tell you to your face, at least in social media, the organizing principle of his GOP is white nationalism. It's a white nationalist party full of people who are just out of their fucking minds. They believe crazy things. They can't be talked out of it. They are offensive to him because they think experts in science are bad. So I, I definitely get that. I definitely understand that. So let's examine that just for a second. Tom Nichols believed that the Republican Party, pretty much 96% of it, 98% of it, are what we call on the left reprogrammable meat bags. <laughs> they cannot be salvaged. They cannot be reasoned with. They keep doing stupid shit. They keep electing monsters. There's no talking to these fucking people. But Joe Biden shouldn't piss off, shouldn't, shouldn't forgive student debt because he might piss off the few among them that are reasonable, you know, because they'll be resentful. Not they will be, liberals won't resent it, but you know, the non college educated white working class man might resent right. Joe Biden. Right. So his political theory is, again, don't deliver for your constituents, but do, no matter what you do, accommodate people who are never, ever, ever going to vote for you in every way possible by making sure you never do anything mm -hmm. that might theoretically piss them off, which leads me to the concept of PMD. And PMD is perfect message discipline. Mm -hmm. And this is a standard to which every fucking never Trumper out there believes every Democratic policy proposal needs to be subjected. And by that, I mean, is there anything anyone out there might possibly do that could be caught on camera on Fox News and used as a weapon against Democrats? Is there some liberal out there in Santa Barbara living under a bridge who might take advantage of the thing and rip the system off? And not deserve it. Yeah. And not deserve it. Right. And that guy will be the star of Fox News for the next 20 months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, so what you're saying is Democrats need to be never propose a, a, any progressive program that could theoretically piss off any right winger because someone might abuse it. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to drop any progressive proposal because everything can be abused. Mm -hmm. And Democrats need to pro need to have perfect message discipline, all 74 million of us, mm -hmm. because we all have to be in the business of asking Trump voters, what can I do to make your life more comfortable? <laughs> uh, is, is this Not is this thing I'm doing make over indebted college graduates make no, 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 them no. more comfortable? Would, would it's, it's asking pretty please? Let me ask you: Is, is me doing this thing over here going to make you mad? Oh, it is. Oh, well, then never mind. Never mind. Yeah. So you're you're telling Democrats that Republicans who might theoretically at some point be mad because some guy in Santa Barbara under a bridge did something wrong should be the governing limit mm -hmm. of any policy. Mm -hmm. This is welfare queen shit. Yeah, right. This is oh, some is. anecdotal... It's, it's, it's young bucks buying yeah. steaks with their food stamps. Yeah. And and what he's saying in, in truth, uh, truth, part of it is, you know, um, Republicans are 
unreasonable meatheads. You can't talk to them or reason with them. So, um, if you don't and Fox News, to them. Well, that's where his brain just shuts off yeah. and goes on autopilot because he cannot just argue that I'm a stingy old man who doesn't like the idea of forgiving debt. It has to be some mm -hmm. electoral reason why Democrats should do what they did during the Obama administration, yeah. which is how can we keep find? Let's find ways to compromise with people who have said explicitly we have no intention of compromising with you ever. Right. And this, when you start listening for this demand for perfect message discipline, mm -hmm. on the, they, they never demanded of themselves. They never demanded of Republicans, but they insist that every Democrat needs to be on the same page. If AOC says the word socialist, That's, you're all doomed. The Democratic Party. Right. You're all doomed. Right. It's a, right. Because Fox said so. And we internalized Fox evil? that as a party. Yeah. Democrats internalized that. And it's wrong. Yeah, they You've did. got to stop doing that. And if you look this week over at the Bulwark, Tim Miller and Charlie Sykes whined for half an hour on the subject of GOP voter suppression. <laughs> and it was all about, well, yeah, it's bad. And it's racist. And it's abusive. And it's wrong. And, and Georgia shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And it's terrible. But calling it the new Jim Crow is excessive. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a uh, hyperbolic and you know what? Something, something, something average America is just going to look at that and say, well, I don't know who to believe Yeah, because you know, you call it the, the new Jim Crow when it's not, you know, not as bad as Jim Crow. And these guys are, might as well be wearing fucking hoods over here. Mm -hmm. um, who do I believe? Yeah. And, and you, and you flip over. It's like, I've had enough of this. I'm up to my throat uh, with this nonsense. So go to MSNBC and there's Noah fucking Rothman. <laughs> Talking about asshole on all of television. Yeah. Talking about what GOP voter suppression uh -huh. and how you know Democrats. Another Joe Biden, just another president who lies about voting. Oh God, because he said because he said uh, Jim Crow. Yeah, it is Jim Crow. I well, and and this is the part again. Their brains don't function like normal humans yeah, do, I know. which is why they probably shouldn't have big microphones and platforms. <laughs> they will. At least Tim Miller and Charlie Sykes will spend five minutes acknowledging, yes, there is a nationwide voter suppression scheme. Republicans are doing it. It's on purpose. It's terrible. But, you know, if if you overreact to it, then then you you will the people won't know what to think because people say, well, you don't have to count jelly beans or do math, so it's not Jim Crow. But no average voter anywhere is thinking that. No. They're but thinking that them, the, the line for waiting for the line for waiting for uh, voting in Georgia, if you're a black person, is over 50 minutes. And for a white right. person, it's four minutes. Yeah. That's, that's Jim Crow. And the idea that these are rough, they're not equivalent. Please don't come at me. And there's always a moment at the bulwark where it's like, I know what you're going to say. And because apparently they listen to me and, and, and they, they do know what I'm going to say. They read your tweets, but not your tweets. <laughs> <laughs> Drift class, there's two things I want to say about student loan forgiveness. Yeah. One is super liberal and one is super, maybe not liberal, but it's tactical. Uh -huh. um, the, the point about student loan forgiveness is that the student loan debt is a drag on our economy. It's That's not to help individual students pay for their education, which is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. I went to expensive schools yep. and had almost $30,000 of student debt when I graduated from, and I got my master's degree, my first master's degree. <clears throat> and for the next 10 years, I didn't own a house or a car. Right. And that's fine for me. But when you multiply that by millions of people of childbearing age who cannot settle down, cannot own a home, cannot own a car, cannot, mm -hmm. <laughs> cannot yep. make a financial future because they're paying $190 and one cent a month in, for the next, until they're 35 years old in student loans, that is such a drag on our, on our nation's economy. It's unsustainable. Yeah. And that's why we're doing student loan forgiveness. It's selfish. <laughs> right. Well, and there, there's a good faith argument to be made about the threshold at which yeah, okay. you should forgive student loans yeah. and, and advanced degrees. What kind of and, conditions you should put on it. Yeah, you know, maybe I, doctors should work in an underserved community right. in exchange Northern for exposure, student loan forgiveness right. for a while if they went to medical yeah. school. Right, right. Yeah. There's, there's all kinds of – but remember, rule number one mm – -hmm. Republicans and ex-Republicans always argue in bad faith. Right, right. They always do. There is there is no um, argument that Tom is making that is in good faith. Yep. It, it is a stingy, libertarian, character-building, I had to do it when like I was male young. Male asshole yeah. position. And because. <laughs> That's <strict lab. laughs> yeah, I'm not, Well, I am all those things. That's true. <laughs> um, but it's also 
a straw man argument, yeah. which is, and even if you are doing this for some misguided sense of virtue, you might piss off some diner dwelling idiot right. in Peoria, and then you then you'll lose the Congress. Who who don't <laughs> have kids in college? Are you kidding right. me? <laughs> I, I just yeah, I scratch my head have and go a grandchild before their child turns forty. Yeah. yeah, and this is the this is the argument you're hearing about infrastructure. Yes, absolutely. you're hearing about voter. It's all the same argument, which is if you do anything that liberals want. Some non, some unknown theoretical well, feel white economic guy. anxiety about what you're doing, right? Because they were you're giving people a fourteen hundred dollar check. You might be making right. somebody mad in a diner in Peoria, yeah. And they were right on the edge there on the election. They didn't know fascist, not fascist, fascist, yeah. not fascist. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'll try non-fascism for a while. But you know what? If you do anything, if you forgive a student loan well, or but, make, but you're easier, bringing me right to my second point, which is student loan forgiveness shouldn't be, okay, you have $50,000 in student loan debt, it's forgiven. It should be, you get a statement from your bank every month that says the Democratic Party paid your student loan this month. Yes, exactly. Because people exactly. will forget and people will think, oh, that's done. I can vote Republican again. You know, Ronald Reagan, number two, Tom Cotton looks really good to me this year. Yeah. I'm for well, national I'd... defense. Sure. And if you're on the if you're on the bubble so much that all of the spending you're getting and all the COVID relief and all of the, you know, Donald Trump being out of your life, or at least mostly, right. is not sufficient to make, you know what, I was thinking Matt Getz might be bad, but, you know, uh, now that they're forgiving student loans in Ohio, I think I'm voting for Getz again. Right. Because, you know, right. I, I don't know that person. I don't know that person exists outside no, of Tom's imagination. Like putting, you know, that was the one thing Donald, the former guy, did right. Which mm -hmm. is, you know, he he wanted his name on the checks. He wanted his name right. on on anything that did well for people. He wanted mm -hmm. his name slapped on it. Right. And Democrats are getting better at doing that. At right now, putting a billboard in Times Square that's as big as a building, saying "Democrats delivered for you shots in the arm, checks in the bank." Right. And you know, pointing to the Republican senators who voted no and putting their picture on a billboard. Yeah. No thanks to this person who voted no for you to have that check. Good for the Democratic. This is, you know, this is Jamie Harrison. Jamie Harrison is is playing it like a 50 state strategy of we're going to take credit when we do something, especially if re every Republican votes no. There's no point in not crowing about what we're doing. Well, and this brings me all the way back to the earliest portion of our show, uh, which is the terrible advice I got from Steve Gilliard, which yeah. is you know, don't self promote. Don't you know it, 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 the work will speak for itself. It never, it never speaks, speaks for, for itself. itself. It not, never not does. No, nope. I was in I was in government for ten years. People around me doing glorious things with public money that you would be shocked and proud of, and they wouldn't, and you couldn't get them to talk about yep. it because I'm and doing Madison my job. Cawthorn goes on Twitter and says, "Congratulations to my constituents getting this COVID money," and then right. everyone pointing out he voted against it. Yeah. All right, let's let's round this up now, Drift Class. Right. I'm so glad you're back and on your feet. Um, well, I'm not on my feet yet, but I'm halfway there. He's, he's better. I was very I'm scared better. Thursday night that you weren't going to get better and that I was going to take you to the ER and I was scared. So I'm glad you're not in that condition anymore. I am too. <laughs> and thank Thanks. you to everybody who wrote in on Twitter or on email or wherever you wrote to say, get well soon, Dirk Glass. We miss you. My Saturday morning coffee isn't the same without you guys, et cetera. We love you so much. It's so sweet. Yeah, I add the bitterness to your Saturday morning coffee. <laughs> so happy to do it. He's, uh, he, 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 his uh, coloring is back, and he's on the mend, and he's eating. Now, I look like, and I look like an Irishman after two whiskeys, not <laughs> an Irishman two days dead. So you know, <laughs> the Bidening continues, Drift Glass. Yes, it does, and I'm very glad to see it. Yes, and uh, we're going to not have a new Internet Kitty until Friday. Our Internet Pet Pancake continues to be the Internet Pet of the week, and he is still crazy about freshly poured sheep food. I guess our fake sponsor. I Hey, I don't I don't make this stuff. I just promote it. So <laughs> And Dog Face Terman wrote us when I told him that Pancake was going to be our chosen pet of the week and said he's getting another sheep and it's gonna be called Waffles. So Pancake oh. and Waffles, you know, you get your choice there. So I'm so and, excited. We'll make sure Waffles <laughs> gets his chance in the spotlight at some point down the road. Uh and you know, feel free to write us. I'm not gonna do a whole uh summation here. Just wanna let you know we're Drift Glass is back. We will be back with a full hour show on Friday. What? <laughs> Maybe it'll be I thought this was no, 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 no. Story. Read my contract. Read my contract. <laughs> you can you can visit our website proleftpod.com for details on how to donate. 
how to buy stuff. You can buy merch. You can become a super fan by wearing a t-shirt, you know, that says both sides don't. We'd love that. And uh, share our show on social media. We do appreciate you doing that. And we, we have a picture. One of our, our listeners sent us a picture of, of them wearing uh, our merch in the wild while voting. While so, voting. That's right. I'll have to put that on. up. I, he gave me permission to share that. I'll have to put that on our Twitter. Pro Left Pod is our Twitter. So Yeah, just rub it in, Blue Gal. Rub in the whole Twitter <laughs> thing. Go ahead. Hey, Drift Class, how are the internet kitties doing in the middle of the week? Well, Blue Gal, same as they were during Friday's theatrical release of this podcast, but twice as long with a lot more special effects. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.